further ado, let's start with our first speaker this morning, Luca Baiguini. He is a trainer. He is an expert in negotiation, team management, leadership, problem solving, communication. And today, he's going to give us a very, very interesting point of view on a topic that I think it's important to all of us, which is decision making. How do you take decision effectively in groups? And how can you balance consensus and conformism so that you really approach the decision making in the most efficient and effective way? How do you do that? Well, I leave the podium, virtual podium, to Luca to explain everything to us. So, good morning everyone and uh, great, great pleasure for me being here today with you. And uh, so we are in a, in a very special time and uh, so, and I think that most of us have uh, to make and to take difficult and uh, decision in this moment and in a very, very new uh, environment and a very new situation. It's for that reason that to give my two cents and my small contribution to your fantastic event, I decided to to try to share something about how how is the process of decision making uh, in uh, in a group, and so to share some small ideas and some insights about about that, and then and then naturally to to discuss them with you. I'm not here to 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 share the the, tr the truth, but I, <laughs> I'm here to to discuss about that with you. And uh, and uh, to start our discussion, I want to start. Uh, I want to start with a story. is a is a story about a sculpture. This sculpture you see in your, on on your screen is a. Um, I read the first time this story in a very interesting book by a, a Canadian American journalist whose name is Malcolm Gladwell. The book is Blink, and um, and I, I, I read this story the first time there, and I found it a very interesting story. This is a this is this sculpture was bought by the the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, California, in 1985, and it's a very strange story. This this sculpture because we are in the mid 80s, and uh, the Getty Museum is a, a young museum. Who was looking for his its positioning in the in the market of of culture and in the market of museums in the, in the and um, it was looking for his position. He it has a huge budget, but uh, but not a very distinctive position in uh, in the market. And uh, and uh, one person came there. His name is Bekina. Came there and said, "I have uh, I have something to to propose you. I have this sculpture." And he brought them with him uh, the, some pictures of the of the sculpture. Of this kuros. Are you interested in this kuros? Uh, you know, kuros is this. A kuros is this kind of sculpture. So a young man is dated normally in the fifth, sixth century before Christ, the Greek sculpture. And this is probably the most beautiful uh, kuros in the world. There are, I think, uh, a dozen of kuros in various museums in the, in the in museums in the world, but probably this one is the, the best one. The, the, um, uh, the most well conserved, and uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's really a masterpiece. And they said, "Are you interested?" And they said, "Yes, of course we are, because this is a this is something you can put on the cover of your catalog." And they said, "Okay, we are interested. How much is the, the cost?" And uh, after a negotiation, they arrived to 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 agree on a price that was uh, around. Uh, 10 million dollars. It was a, we are in 80s, so it was a large amount. It's still a large amount of money for a, for a sculpture. And, but they said, yes, but before paying, we want to, we have to check. We want to, we have to check if this sculpture is authentic or is a fake. So we have, we ask you to bring us the, the, the sculpture 
and to leave the cal the sculpture here for some weeks uh, to check if this one is a is a is a real one or is, it, or is a is a fake. And uh, so the Mr. Bekina sent the sculpture to the Getty Museum, and they started performing their analysis of the sculpture. First thing they asked to the scientific committee and, um, and the scientific committee analyzed the style of the culture and of the sculpture and, and, uh, and tried to understand if this could be a real one. And, and they agreed, apart for one person who was Federico Zeri, they all agreed that this was a real, uh, a real one. So their opinion was, uh, they checked and they said, okay, yes, for us it's, it's real. But uh, for the Getty Museum, the, the, the advice of the scientific committee was not enough. So what they said, what they did, they asked to uh, an expert of stone, on, of marble, to understand if this marble was, uh, uh, was a real one. So it was a marble that was used by the uh, artists in the, in the sixth century before Christ in Greek. And, and he found that this mar marble was from a, a cave that was used by the artist at the time. So the marble was, uh, um, was mm, his advice was that the, the sculpture could be a real one and not a fake. And then this sculpture is made by in, uh, in a, uh, the, the marble is a dolomite and the dolomite, uh, when uh, it's exposed to the atmosphere, transform itself in calcite. So by, uh, by uh, looking at how deep and how thick uh, is the layer of calcite, you can do a rough, you, you can give a, a roughly the age of the sculpture. And the layer of calcite was, uh, was really, uh, was, was thick enough to, uh, to um, to think that this sculpture was authentic. Then naturally they, they asked for uh, to some lawyers to, to check the documentation the, of the sculpture and they also gave uh, a positive advice about the documentation. So they say, yes, they, we see no problem in the documentation. And, and all this process took more than two months to the Getty Museum. And they were so proud of their process of decision making that they wrote, they submitted an, uh, a paper to Scientific American to show how they decided that this sculpture was a real one and not a fake. They were really proud about their work. And they prepared a room for this sculpture. So they prepared a room and a stage and they were ready to show this sculpture to the world. Some days before the opening, the official opening of the, of the room, arrived to the Getty Museum, Evelyn Harrison. Evelyn Harrison was, and still is, one of the, one of the, uh, greatest expert in the US about uh, Greek culture and Greek art. And, uh, and uh, so they, they said, okay, let's show, let's show her uh, this sculpture because I wa I, we, wanna, we wanna have uh, her advice how, so how she feels with the, the, this sculpture. And, uh, and so they prepare the stage and they cover the, the sculpture and uh, Evelyn Harrison arrived there and the general manager of the Great Museum did uh, this scene to the, in front of her and said, this is, a, this is our newest acquisition bought for $10 million. And he uncovered the, the sculpture and showed this masterpiece to Evelyn Harrison. And Evelyn Harrison looked at the sculpture and said, oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Why, Evelyn, this is a masterpiece. And she, she said, but it's a fake. The general man of the Getty Museum said, no, Evelyn, it's not a fake. We analyzed it, we 
we, our scientific committee, which is made by experts, it said this is a real one. Then we analyzed the marble. Then we saw and we did a, we performed a lot of different analysis to to demonstrate that this is a real one. So this, Evelyn, this is not fake. And she she answered, but it's so easy to understand that this is a fake. This is not a real one. Every every expert of art could tell you that this is fake. This is for sure, I'm sure, this is a fake. But naturally, they didn't believe to Evelyn Harrison because they have all the proofs, eh? they have all the evidence that uh, uh, this was a real one. They performed a lot of tests. It was not possible that this was a fake. Some days after, after the, they, then they opened the, the, door, the, the door of this uh, of this new room and some days after the opening of the door another great art expert american art expert whose name is tom herring is uh, he was the foreman general manager of the metropolitan museum in new york and uh, arrived to the getty museum and so they decided to show him uh, the, the new masterpiece they bought and so they, they, they did the same uh, the same show eh, as like every Arizon. so they covered the, the sculpture tom Harris arrived in front of the sculpture and the general manager of the getty museum uncovered the sculpture and said this is our newest acquisition boat for 10 million dollars and do you know what uh, uh, he tom Harris answered I'm very sorry to hear that. Why? Because this is a fake. And uh, he had exactly the same opinion of Evelyn Harrison. And, and then to the Getty Museum, they started to have some doubt about their own decision. And when they opened the, the door of the, of, the, of the room and so everyone could see, naturally a lot of art experts went we go to the Getty Museum, they saw the sculpture, and this sculpture was really, um, so everyone is, get, every expert has great doubts about this sculpture. The great majority thought that, uh, and said that this was, this was, this, it was evident that this was a fake. This was not a real one. And so at the Getty Museum, they, they decided to do, to do one more thing to demonstrate that this was a real sculpture. So in Athens, in Greek, there was a, in Greece, there was a, um, a symposium of uh, the world's great experts of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Greek culture and Greek art. And, um, and they sent the kuros to this, uh, to this, uh, to this meeting and they put on the stage of this meeting the, the of this uh, of this uh, symposium the sculpture and they uncovered it and the reaction the average reaction was oh oh my god what you what are you doing you crazy american that you that sent us a sculpture on this on this country that is the the origin of uh, of the culture in all over Europe and perhaps the world and and you show us a sculpture that is uh, really if it's it's really it's evident it's a fake so what are you doing you crazy Americans and and naturally at the Getty Museum they were surprised about that because they said. What are, you, what are you saying? We did, we performed a, a lot of different tests. We did, we, we stayed in, a, we stayed on this topic for two months and then during two seconds you say, this is a fake. And we have the proof that eh, the marble and, but in the month later, uh, later on this, uh, on this symposium and uh, naturally this culture um, started a debate between the experts and and one expert of marble demonstrated that uh, that um, um, demonstrated that you can transport, transform transform uh, dolomite in calcite in some mounds with a a mixture, I remember that there were the potatoes in this mixed up. So if you put the marble in this, 
in this mixture it can transform dolomite and calcite in some months, not in some hundreds of years or thousands of years. And then um, the documentation of the, also the documents uh, that uh, were joined with this, with this culture, with, sent with this culture by the merchant, have some errors. For example, there was a postal, co uh, postal code of London that was on a, on a letter between a buyer and the seller that, uh, of the sculpture that has a postal code that was created only five years after the date of the letter. And, uh, and then uh, in, the, in, uh, London, uh, in London, they discovered uh, a mold, a mold that could be used, you could be used to produce the draft of this sculpture. Because you know that to, 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 to build a, a so high sculpture, then you, you make a, a smaller model, and from, the, from this model, you, then you do, you do the, the, the sculpture normally. This is normally the process. And there was a, a mold to produce this model and uh, the mold was made in plastic so probably it was not possible to date this mold in uh, uh, sixth century before christ and and we have, we have not a final answer right, to the question uh, is this one a real sculpture a real one or is this one a fake this sculpture but but uh, uh, the great majority of the art experts think that this one, this one is one of the most embarrassing errors the scientific committee of Getty Museum or a scientific committee of any museum anywhere made in evaluating a, a, a piece of art. So, and, and if you go to the Getty Museum catalog today, the, the sculpture is still at the Getty Museum, and if you go to the Getty Museum sculpture, uh, sorry, catalog, this is what is written on the Getty Museum catalog. Author unknown, Greek, about 530 before Christ, or modern forgery. So what, that, what they are saying is that it's more than possible that they made a great one of the most embarrassing mistakes of the uh, of the of this of probably the most embarrassing mistake of the story of this museum i find that this story quite simple, but what is interesting of this story that they perf they they had a lot of time to decide they had a lot of time to uh, to see, uh, to see the truth, but they didn't. And arrived at Everett Harrison, uh, Tom Hollings, the other expert discovered it in a, in, a, in fact, the, the title of, uh, of the, the book is Blink for Rapid, they, they discovered it just one second. So, so this, is ma this makes this, is, is this story very inter interesting for me that because I study decision making processes. So, this is just, I, I find this story very, very interesting. So what I ask you, and I'd like to, to, to open, eh, to open uh, the, uh, the, the chat to your, um, to your questions and uh, to your questions. Um, I have a question to, no, not to your question. I, I want to start, I want to open uh, the, the chat to, to ask you a question. And my question is, what happened to the Getty Museum? In your opinion, why they did a so embarrassing error in doing an evaluation? That is his job, eh? it's, it's their, their job is evaluating the, uh, the, this piece of art. Is if there is, Someone who wants to, to share some opinion about that, you are, you are welcome. Yes, Eric, group thing to cover. I fall, if I follow the title, yes, group think. Yes, group think is a very interesting topic. And they, they were perhaps really keen on having a positive result. Exactly, exactly, thank you, Cisco. 
wishful thinking they wanted to be, they wanted it to be authentic yes and therefore blind yes honestly paid off yes and more visitors came this is Harald is very interesting it's a very interesting topic i will go back on that in uh, after after looking for only positive results and discarding facts that did not fit the model they were looking for thank you eric yes absolutely yes they didn't listen to the experts when they should. But uh, uh, Tarek, I, I just had at one point, they had their own expert, uh, expert, expert because uh, the scientific committee was made by art experts. So, so, so it's true that they could invite before, but uh, then I will, ask you a, I will ask you a question eh, about that. Thank you. There is a reason that an expert in the field is called an expert in the field. He should have started from there. Yes, but it's the same. Uh, but perhaps I didn't explain uh, very clearly. Also, the scientific committee was made of art experts, naturally. They didn't listen to the guts and guts and Sylvie, yes. They didn't follow original reason. One expert didn't agree, yes. For the same reason, Volga did this error <laughs> this at Carl K. Maxine, thank you. <laughs> they didn't listen to the expert, Federico Zeri, yes. Or they, they didn't listen to the only one who, was, who didn't agree with them. Provocative tension is so terribly hard to distinguish it from a fake. Does it really matter? Yes, <laughs> Antonio. Yes, but um, uh, I just thought that they were positioning themselves. So if when you are positioning yourself in the market and you become famous because you buy um, fakes, I don't think it's a very good position for a, for a museum. We are still not sure they made a mistake. Yes, of course, Fabio, Flavio, but the, really the great majority think this was a, a mistake. Is a famous thing? The 12 jurors, yes, yes. I, uh, yes, this is a, this is, yes, this is another example. Eh? Harald, uh, this is another story I sometimes, uh, I sometimes use. So it's very interesting movie. Hmm? But the time of the is unlikely that the decision had been made and cash paid. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, Thank you, thank you for all your uh, opinion. Yes, I, because, you know, there are two ways to, uh, to answer this question. The first way is they made a mistake because they were not fit to, this, to their role. So they, they the, this mistake is made by, because these specific people were in this process and so they were not uh, competent enough, uh, they were not honest, uh, they were not... Uh, they, so it's like to the people. The first way to solve this problem is, is this, the error came because these specific people were involved in this process and they, did, they made the mistakes. There is another way to solve this problem uh, or to answer this question is that the problem is in the process, not in the people. And we have two, these two ways. We analyze the, the, the mistakes and also the success in decision making by these two criteria. The first one is people. The second one is structure. And Daniel Kahneman, who is a fa very famous psychologist who, um, who, who, who um, his field of research is uh, cognitive biases, uh, call this uh, the fundamental attribution error. What is the fundamental attribution error? It's the fact that we normally overweight the effect of people and underweight the, under the importance of people and underweight the importance of the structure of the process the structure of the decision-making process. And, uh, and uh, normally for us it's easier to solve, uh, to answer the question focusing on people more than focusing on uh, the structure. But doing that we 
overweight the impact of people and underweight the impact of the structure. And naturally, what I want to do with you today in this uh, 20 minutes we have to, to stay together is to go deeper in the process of decision making. Because when we collect information, the phases, you know, the decision making process has three main phases the problem setting, we uh, we define the field of the, pro of the problem. The problem solving, we try to find solutions and decision making when we decide which solution to, we have to implement. In the problem setting and problem solving phases, we can do two things. Eh? So we, we have no, we have two, um, two main topics that impact on this. The first one is the in the phases of problem setting and problem solving and we try to build consensus uh, because consensus is a, is a very important thing in a group. If there is consensus, there is leadership. Leadership, in my definition, leadership is the capacity to build consensus in the group, in a group. But uh, unfortunately, consensus has a dark side. It's, all, it's called conformism. Conformism is the dark side of consensus because the more you have consensus, the more you risk the conformism. Because the more you are able to build consensus and the more the critic, the critic opinion are underweighted in your group. And the problem is that, for to use a French, this is a cul-de-sac because it's something very good for you, consensus, that brings with, with itself something very bad, that is conformism. So what I want to try to, to explain with you and to, to share with you is how I can avoid conformism maintaining consensus. Is it possible or is not? And to do that, I wanna, I just wanna, I wanna, I wanna um, pose that when we have to gather information, uh, when we have to gather information, we have two, two ways to gather information in a group. The first way is this one. Uh, we, is the Getty Museum way. So what we do, we, put on the table a problem and then we ask to the experts, the insiders, to give us their opinion and their opinion has to be impartial, so without preconceived ideas, not partisan, impartial. This is the first way with which we gather information. It is a very, very common way. Yeah? The second way we gather information, it's this one. The second way, it's, it's not impartial, it's partial. When the, the, the first one to, to, to postulate this second way was Socrates. Eh? Socrates asked to his, uh, to, his, uh, to his school this question sometimes, of what color is this paper? And they probably answer white. And he said, no, for me it's black. Because he thought, really thought it was black, no, it was not crazy. Yes, it was quite crazy, Socrates, but it was not so crazy. But he, because he thought that if you have a thesis, the best way to go near to the truth is to pose and to put on the table an antithesis so that you arrive to the synthesis this was the process for which he built, uh, he built this, gathered information about a process. If there is a thesis, I post the antithesis. And, uh, and this is the way, um, in this, this, we use sometimes the way, this way to gather information. There are some, some context where this is the way uh, this is the way, yes, I agree, Flavio, it's like proper falsification, yes. Uh, 
this is in this way we got an information in some kind of fields and contexts. The first one is the tribunal, the court, eh? where there is a, uh, there are two attorneys. And do you expect from an attorney to be impartial? No, do you expect to be partial in two ways, in two meanings to be partial? The first meaning is to be partisan, but also to play a part. Uh, the second, another, another field where we decided the way is when we, um, we have to decide if a person has to become a, a saint or not. There was a commission in the Vatican, there was a commission and they had to decide if this person did enough miracle and have a, a so uh, honest life to become a saint. And, uh, and do you know what they did? They divided in two groups. Uh, they divided in two groups and, uh, and the first one, and the first one, in the first group, they looked for the proofs to, the, the positive proofs proof for to be to to decide to to make this person a saint and the second one they looked for the proof the contrary proof the critic proofs and this you know what was the group uh, the name of the group this group the evils advocate the uh, this uh, expression the evils advocate arrived from this from this um, um, from this process of decision making. And if I tell you, make for me the evil advocate, you can tell me your critics, but without uh, attacking my, uh, the consensus. So in my opinion, the capacity of a team leader during the process of gathering information is this capacity to, in some ways, alternate these two different and to skip from one to the other to the two different ways to gather information. The first one, when I need impartial information from some insider and so when I need not uh, um, so mm, information without preconceived ideas, without uh, being partisan. But sometimes when I smell that there is some conformist, too many yes, like in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in the process of the Getty Museum, too many people that say, yes, it is. When I feel uh, this, this uh, sensation, I could skip to the other way and ask people, do my devil's advocate? But it's me, it's the team leader that give the part to my, uh, to my group. So if I, if I am the one who asked to be the devil's advocate, then, or to be the critic, then I can, in some ways, avoid conformism or, uh, or decreasing the end impact of conformism, but without losing consensus. So in my view, this is a first way eh, to do that. But I have a second thing to share with you to, 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 to complete the, the model. I have a second thing to, to, to share with you and uh, because you see that in the, in the, in the, um, in the um, left part of the slide, you see we, we are inside, oh, sorry, just one more thing, just one more thing I didn't remember to, to say. Naturally, this second model is also, a, is also in, in literature, is also some, uh, some people who, who developed this model, the second model of being partisan and playing a part. The first one perhaps was Edward de Bono with the, the famous model of six, six thinking heads, where you have one head, the black one, who is the, the head of the critic. And also 
uh, Robert deals with the Disney strategy where he mapped how Walt Disney developed his uh, methodology to, to design his famous movies. And here we have three kinds of thoughts. The dreamer, who is the, the, the one who does the goal setting. The realist, who is the one who set up the how to, is the project manager, how to arrive to the result. And then the critic, who is the one who evaluates the, the proposed plan. And the critic is the evil advocate. Eh? So we have a lot of models. When, once we know the difference between these two ways to gather information, then there were a, there, there were a lot of models. And, and the limit there is our creativity. And eh? we can also develop models, parts to be played and ways to be partisan, to ask people to be partisan, to be critic without using Without losing, uh, uh, without losing consensus. Someone asked for the previous slide, realist, but I will uh, will send you the slides there, so we'll have all, all my slides. Uh, you will have uh, the the, uh, the slides, so you can you can go back to to this because I wanna I wanna spend this last five minutes to to put in discussion also the other part, you know, that on the, you see that on the left uh, of, of my picture, so when uh, we have the first way, I said insider and uh, in impartial, mm? insider and impartial. So first thing I put in discussion the impartial. Eh? I said there is an alternative. You can be also partial, being partisan and playing a part. But can also put in discussion that I need an insider to, uh, to have an effective problem solving and decision making process. In my opinion, yes. And, uh, and to go deeper there, I want to make a distinction between these three words, research, creativity, and innovation. Because we use, and also in literature, eh, is, are used sometimes uh, indifferently and eh? research, creativity, innovation, like they have quite the same meaning. So I, I want to share with you a meaning and it's not the only one, but a meaning for these three words. For me, research is an approach, is a vertical and qualitative approach. The deeper, the better. When you do a research, you, you look for someone that go deeper, vertical qualitative contribution that give you this kind of contribution. Creativity is a lateral and quantitative um, uh, approach. The more the better. The classic example here is brainstorming where everyone has to give a lot of ideas because the, our mindset is pro possibly in these hundreds of ideas, I will find the, the one who will change our perception of the, of the problem, of our perception of, the, of a field, of a discipline, of every, anything. So you, 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 you look for quantity, not for quality. Innovation is the result of a process that alternate in an effective way moments of research and moments of creativity. The process of problem solving has to be both possibilities, eh? both possibilities, a vertical and qualitative approach on one side and the lateral quantitative approach on the other. If I am in the task of the team leader here, the capacity of the team leader is to to understand when I need a, an, an approach like the research and, I, and when I need a creativity-like approach and how I alternate these two kinds of different approaches. But if we can go, if we go back, do you remember when, that we said the first way we look for insiders? But in your opinion, no, it's a rhetoric question, I will answer, but to do, uh, to have a creativity approach is the 
is the insider the right person to give you a creative a creative idea probably not because the insider is difficult for an insider to question the basic principles uh, to question the um, let's say the assumption eh? to question the assumption of the of the problem probably we can need an outsider so one person who is not fully involved in the in the decision making process is probably we need someone who is the mind is clear the mind is clean eh, on this uh, about this process so and to to finish the last last thing so i give you some minutes to to the q and a five minutes to the q and a we can cross these two dimension in a matrix and this is this is what I'm, work, what I'm working on uh, in this moment and what I'm writing on. Because in my opinion, in a problem setting and a problem solving process, there are four possible kind of actors, actors, sorry, four kind of actors. And, uh, and the, the kind of actor is the cross between two di these two dimensions. On one side, we have the domain expertise, the insider versus the outsider. On the other side, we have the relationship structure, the impartial relationship structure where everyone plays simply his own part. And the partial one where the team lead is the team leader that decides what kind of part everyone has to play. So this is we have this four kind, uh, these four kind of actors, the impartial insider is the one who arrives there with an impartial approach and a deep domain expertise. The partial insider, like the attorney eh, who, has, who knows the topic, is an insider, but is partisan and plays a part. The impartial outsider is, the, is one who will is an outsider, so is, he has not a deep knowledge, but can give creative ideas and in, in an impartial way, playing his own part. And the last one, the partial outsider, is one person who is, is an outsider, but to which the team leader give a part to play. So is an outsider, for example, to which the team leader asks, Please do my devil's advocate. Do my devil's advocate. And, um, and so, for my, in my idea, this is a topic uh, to which a team leader has to deal with uh, because it has to be the ability to move the people and the group in this four, in this four deep, uh, playing these different four actors. So, thank you. Thank you, um, and we have uh, we have five minutes, I think, uh, to the Q and A's. I don't know if there are some questions to to answer. Thank you, Luca. I collected one question uh, quite at the beginning of your explanation, and I think maybe we can start with that, and then we can see if someone else wants to add. And the question was. How can the team leader assure that the impartial actors in the process can really be impartial? Yes, yeah, this is the, oh yes, of course. Um, naturally, the quality, of the, the quality of the information I have to, from the impartial are to be, have to be checked. But I think that if you, have the, if you give the possibility to the group also to be partial, you can also, um, you can also make it easier to discover when someone is not, uh, is not transparent in being impartial or is not, uh, is not um, honest in being impartial. Because if you give to the group the possibility to move to the critic and to go back to the impartial, then you, it's easier to discover this. Naturally, it's, uh, 
it's, a, it's one part of the work of the team leader to try to discover if someone seems impartial, but, but is not. I see another question popping up, so I would use this, uh, this last uh, three minutes for that. Um, do you, if you have specific techniques used to break the conformism and how you can avoid that a person that is justly acting as a devil's advocate can actually be ostracized and flagged as a naysayer? Yes, this is the, this is the, 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 uh, the center of this model. Because if it's me that, because you have, uh, as a team leader, you have to move the group, you have to move the group in these two different ways. So it's you that give the instruction to the uh, devil's advocate to do it. So you, have, you go to the group or to a part of the group and tell, be my devil's advocate. It's me the task. And, and for that reason, they then, then won't be, won't be um, ostracized because it's you that do it. Naturally, when you have finished this phase, you put people off of this part, off of this game. So it's you that move the group and you sponsor, in these moments, you sponsor critics. It's for that reason that people can be critic, but you don't lose leadership because it's you that sponsor the process. And naturally, you open and close, eh? you open and close this set. Because if it's you that manage, you don't have the problem that they will be isolated. And if you have a group that tend to ostracize these people, you should ask to all the group to be the devil's advocates in some moments. In that way, if they, if they do all together, the paradox is that the, the, the most uh, able to do the devil's advocate is also the one who you give more value. I hope I answer to, to, to the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of other questions, um, but I am afraid that we need to close for a break. I'm asking Lorenzo if he thinks that we can maybe shorten the break or what should we do? Uh, so if you ask me, so we have 10 minutes. I think people that want to have a break, they can have a break. And maybe if others want to listen five more minutes, we can do five more minutes of questions and then five minutes break and we start. Mm -hmm. John. Okay. So I will take the time to ask the very last question that I see in the chat. So uh, if you have to make the choice and you have two different uh, opinions, one is coming from the insider, let's say it's negative, and another one from the outsider, which is positive. Mm -hmm. You tend to choose the positive one because like your guts are going for the positive. How, how, how do you proceed in this case? Like if, if it's like a practical example. Okay, thank you. So let's, but let's split the two different problems. Eh? One is about uh, uh, conformism and uh, uh, consensus. The other is about creativity and uh, research. Okay, so um, concerning creativity and research, the problem Oh, concerning creativity, to be, to be more precise, the problem, do you know what is the problem? Is how I choose the most promising ideas. Hmm? Because the, in the creative phase, you have a lot of different ideas shared on the table, but how I choose the most promising one? Because probably on this most promising one, I have to do a research process because creativity, creative idea can to be a lot, but can be superficial, not uh, very documented, not, ver not demonstrated and so on, because they have to, to, to move you from here to here, not to go deeper. So how can I choose? And this is a very, it's a very difficult topic. I'm thinking about that really at this moment. And uh, 
and I'm writing about that. So when I will have solved this problem, I will share for sure with you. But uh, so this is one topic. The second one is, and, and it is the first we saw, is uh, how I deal with these dynamics between consensus and uh, conformism. Naturally, we are here in the phases of problem setting and problem solving. Then there is the decision making process. And they say the decision making is the moment of the process where I, I decide what to value and what not to value, what to consider and what not to consider. And, um, the, and naturally here we have the know-how of the team leader. Eh? Here is the, the, the part where the team leader has the, the most important role, the most important part. Because we don't have a, a recipe for that. And it, because it's really deeply, um, deeply lied to the kind of problem I have to solve, to the field where the problem has to him impacts. But in my opinion, this model, this way of looking at the interaction in the group improves the quality of the information you gather during the phases of problem setting and problem solving. And if you improve the quality, then I hope it becomes easier to choose what kind of information is, most in, is more important now and what kind of information is more, has to be more impacting on my decision. But you have always to split these two different dimensions, the domain expertise and the relational structure, because also in literature, these two dimensions sometimes are confused. What I am trying to stress with you this morning that is that if you split these two dimensions, and so you have four different, these four different kinds of actors for every part of your problem setting and problem solving process, you, you will become able to, uh, to activate the most productive kind of process of gathering information. Thank you, Luca. I think this was very comprehensive. Um, as I would like our audience to get a couple of minutes break, I really want to thank you. And as uh, Lorenzo was mentioning earlier in the chat, we are going to share the materials from this presentation. I think we collected a lot of very, very good topics to think about and research on. And Luca also gave us some very good references that we can use. So we will have our homework uh, to do starting from here. Thank you very much for giving us uh, all these tips and well, good, good luck to everyone uh, starting researching deeper about this topic.